When I first started, I was excited but nervous about this responsibility of being a faculty member and making sure my students had a quality education. And because I was nervous, that made the classroom environment a little more uncomfortable. And so you have to remember to relax and have fun and to really focus on the important goals. So I did uh, what many first time teachers often do a common mistake of trying to cover too much content to make sure that they got every little piece that I could possibly give them. Um, and that was a little stressful for the students. The other thing was that you, as you're learning all of these new teaching techniques that are effective and helpful for the students, it's easy to get overwhelmed. But it's just important to remember that you do the best you can and you take it one step at a time. So maybe um, you work on learning outcomes for each of your lessons the first year and the next year you can add more comprehension checks at the end of each teaching tidbit and the next year you add some more active learning activities and you don't have to do it all at once. You know, here at USU we use those idea objectives and I think that's for a new teacher out there, look at those objectives and put those on your syllabus and let students know what they're going to be, what's going to be covered in the class. Students want to know, we all want to know what's going to happen next. We've all heard this one, I took the final, he didn't cover any of that or she didn't cover any of that, right? Yeah. Like you're smiling, we've all done that. This, none of this was covered in class. Where did, where did he or she get this? Did he pull the wrong file out of the cabinet, you know, or whatever? Yeah. So we want to know. Let students know what they're going to be learning. I think digging into the literature, so evidence-based teaching practices is, is the thing I would look at, and not anecdotal evidence. And there's so much anecdotal evidence that's used in teaching. Well, this was fun for me. My students seemed to like it. It was good. But, but what's the evidence, you know, the old Missouri thing, you know, show me. Something that was really a struggle for me that I do a lot better with now than I used to is I used to think like, oh, I'm teaching, you know, I'm going to teach about cells or whatever. So I just dive into, you know, cells and, you know, what activities, whatever could we do related to cells. But I'm like in this little tiny box and I'm not like looking at the big picture. So I try to approach things now with the big picture view first, you know, kind of this whole backwards design idea. Sure. You know, really at the end of, you know, say Biology 1010, like what would I want my students to know? Like what could they maybe go home and like chat about with their families about at Sunday dinner? You know, I mean, what are the, some of those big ideas? So kind of start with the end in mind maybe and kind of see that big picture and then you can start devising kind of the smaller units and content pieces because when you just kind of dive in, you know, chapter one, thing one, sure. It's like, you might get to the end of the semester and realize, like, I didn't even get to this, or, you know, why did I teach them that, or why did I get so in-depth on that? Really, maybe kind of start with the end in mind. Here at USU, we have so many resources. Um, and again, you can take it one step at a time. Um, talk to your colleagues about teaching explicitly. Ask them what they do. Um, finding a mentor is, is very helpful, a teaching mentor. Um, and then they can share with you all of these resources that have been helpful to them. Um, and that kind of teamwork is really helpful. And I try and get my students to work together as a team as well. I, I guess just what I mentioned, and I've, I've kind of said this before, be really careful of a few things. One is don't listen to colleagues and fall into the trap of repeating what they say of, oh, students are way worse today than when I was a student, and every year they're getting worse and worse, and the students are getting less engaged. If you really start believing that, then it's dangerous. And so you don't have to and can't really be you know, in the mind of an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old because the students are getting so worse, it doesn't really matter what I do, and they just can't get it. So don't do that. So always, be, you know, <laughs> always be looking to say, uh, you know, how can I reach these students? And they're not any worse and probably not any better than they were before. They may, the, the technology's different and, and maybe they were plugged into technologies. They have to be. Be sensitive to your students. That is where they're coming from 
uh, and how technologies change and be sensitive with, if you make it as long in this business as I have to your age and the disconnect and that you know your view of the world is different from your students view of the world than, than somebody like me was when I was a student but they're all looking to learn and they're anxious to learn and you have to tap into that maybe I'll use an acronym to kind of help and and the acronym is REACH. So R stands for be reasonable and, uh, and have reasonable expectations for your students but also for yourself. And uh, especially if you're a first time teacher, like you're a rookie and it's okay. And, and the best way to learn is to get bucked off a few times <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and get up and dust yourself off and say, all right, I know that doesn't work or I know this does work. And then E would be, be enthusiastic. I, I feel like students really sense when you're excited about uh, your, your subject and, and your content. And, um, and I think another way to communicate that to them is, is, to be, is to help them see that you're also learning and you're going to continue in education events and conferences and uh, like I used to feel like students expected me to be an entertainer and to be, you know, I, I'm just not. I'm like I'm a pretty classic introvert, <laughs> but I feel like you can still connect uh, in in ways that feel genuine and and demonstrate enthusiasm for what you're sharing with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And then um, uh, notice and recognize the good stuff. That's good advice. Yeah. And. Um, and I feel like people are more inclined to give you more if, you, if you're positive about what they are doing right. Um, so A would be uh, be approachable. So just, you know, basic, be friendly, be happy, um, <laughs> yeah. and, and ask questions, but also um, uh, with that, I would say be authentic. And, and I used to think that authentic mean, meant that I had to, you know, share my, like, every detail of my life. And I think you can overshare. Letting them in a little bit and helping them see your humanness. Human, yeah, right. Uh, it helps them relax as well. And so, yeah, be approachable. Like in my office, uh, when you come, like I try to make it an inviting space. Uh, that's one thing that's made me more approachable is to have an office space that's inviting. And then C would be um, be connected. Uh, be connected to their world um, and like what what they're interested in and how they learn and um, but also create opportunities in your class where they can connect with each other. And then part of that is be for for you yourself to be connected with your your colleagues and peers and I, I think uh, the best advice I could give would be find a mentor and find a peer so a mentor who's further down the road than you are who's kind of you know figured some stuff out and, and go to them for advice or for help or for resources but also find a peer who's kind of on your same level or starting out the same uh, the same way and someone who can kind of identify with all the challenges that or uh, things that you're feeling and it doesn't have to be a peer in your same discipline sure it can be a peer in, uh, or even at the same institution and I think that they really help uh, guide you from day to day on uh, where to go and then H would be uh, be healthy you know the basic get enough sleep eat well and uh, move uh, also, you know, have have some other hobby or um, passion project outside of teaching. I think my first piece of advice for students who are debating whether or not they should take on a teaching opportunity is to do it. Go outside your comfort zone and try it because you really just don't know how much or to what extent you will enjoy it. I really was not a person that liked public speaking and it really wasn't until I got into the teaching environment that I realized that it's a very different type of public speaking. 
And uh, I think that was, again, I don't think I would have realized how much I love teaching without actually doing it. My other advice was, would be to use your resources, your faculty, your department head. Again, all of the resources, I think we've got such great support here at USU, especially for teaching. Uh, when I've uh, talked to colleagues in other universities, they don't have uh, um, ETE, they don't have the support from administration down to really provide all of these uh, different uh, um, workshops and uh, conferences and things. And so I would say, use all of those opportunities, especially early on, to not only attend, but really be engaged, connect with those faculty who teach or who are um, presenting, because again, they're wanting to help and they're wanting to kind of take their, their pedagogy of teaching and their lessons learned and share them and help you through that process. And so I think any of those opportunities, whether it's internal within the USU system or external, if that's an option too, so I, year, when I was a new teacher for many years through grad school and even a, a little bit beyond, one of the things that I did is I picked on students by name to answer questions. And I thought in my mind that what I was doing was making sure that my students all knew that I knew them by name. And I thought that's going to you know, get them engaged uh, and, and make them know that I know about them and care about them. And it's going to keep them you know, engaged because... I'm, they know that at any moment I could ask them a hard question about chemistry. As it turns out, this, I didn't realize this. I'd done it for years. Feedback from anonymous surveys of students said they hated this. They hated this. And I realized why when I read the feedback. They hated doing this. So I would say this is a teaching technique. Don't ever do that. Don't pick hard questions about your concepts and then pick a, one and single out one individual by name and say, can you answer this question? Because it's putting them on the spot and just freaking them out. Don't do that. I used to do that. I stopped doing that. <laughs> and the reason I stopped doing that is because of this principle, being willing to learn from my mistakes and, and, uh, and, dot, and not be afraid of change. So I changed that. And this is where I changed to bridging questions. Whenever I single out an individual to ask them a question, it's always a non-threatening question. It's never, ever, ever subject-based. It's always, hey, tell me something interesting about, you know, what, what, what are you finding challenging right now? Or tell me something about yourself that's interesting or something fun. I don't know. But I never, when I ever, I, whenever I single out individuals, it's to ask something that is not topic specific and threatening where they're going to feel embarrassed if they get the answer wrong. It's always something that's really benign like that. Whenever I ask a specific topical question, it's always to a group. So I will say, students in Logan, I want you to tell me uh, what the orbital hybridization is of a carbon atom and acetone. And take your time, you can all discuss it as a group, and I'll give you 10 minutes and you can get back to me. I have a lot of students who have backgrounds that I know nothing about, and students that are dealing with situations um, that are quite varied. And so I think that over the years I've become a more compassionate teacher, and I've gone a little bit more out of my way to be willing to work with students who you know, that have different things happening in their life that they can't necessarily control. I think when I first started teaching, it was like, okay, this is how it's going to go, and we're all going to be on the same timeline. And I think I've become more flexible over the years. And that was something that just, I guess, hadn't occurred to me until I started really interacting with my students and kind of learning more about them. Yeah. I think it would just be have confidence in yourself. And uh, again, you don't have to be perfect at it, and uh, you will you will grow and advance and develop as you go through the process. And um, it's I think a really cool experience to kind of see where you started as a first-time teacher and to where you can become.